this is Ajay here. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur based out of Mysore. Uh, I want to, you know, uh, I'll be anchoring the session today. So we have a very uh, short and crisp agenda for today. Uh, we have two high achievers joining us uh, from different walks of life, and they'll be giving a very a small peek into their uh, journey, their uh, you know entrepreneurship lessons, and probably you know inspire us tonight. So. Firstly, a big round of applause for all of us for coming here uh, and making this a good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, friends. In spite of, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'll try to do a warm welcome. I know it's not so very warm outside there. Uh, uh, thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, welcome to uh, uh, the two speakers, extraordinary, uh, Sanjeev and Sharma. Uh, I'm looking, we, we, I'm sure we are all looking forward to their uh, address and their uh, uh, experience sharing. And hopefully there will be a little bit of time also to interact. I know we are, uh, we've overrun on time from our previous meeting. Welcome to all the uh, board members who are here. Thai Mysuru chapter board members, uh, CMs, charter members, associate members. Uh, we usually have a few institution members. Uh, hopefully they will come in and uh, student members too. Um, so welcome you all and uh, without taking uh, too much time, I will uh, hand over to the moderator and invite the first speaker of the day. Thank you. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, sorry uh, for everyone for starting a little late because of the rain, I believe it took time for a lot of people to arrive. But without further uh, ado, I would like to start uh, by thanking uh, Mr. Sanjeev Chandrasekhar for being here. In fact, uh, not just for being here, but for being the first to come to the venue. E even at the same time when the you know event organizers came here, probably he was here at around 5.15 or 5.30, I believe. And uh, he's been wonderful throughout and uh, he's been so accommodative and cooperative that it reflects a true Mysore culture uh, because he coming, you know, traveled all across the world and he's here today. But uh, I heard from him that he was Mr. Sudan Masar's uh, junior in college at, uh, senior in college at DMS uh, and then at JC Mysore. So two links to Mysore and then uh, making, you know, the national level uh, where he studied at IIT Kanpur. And then one of the international big leagues where he went to Wharton School. So he has been, uh, you know, a high achiever, as was mentioned earlier, uh, from Mysore. Uh, and then he has, uh, uh, you know, pulled a lot of uh, you know experiences in various companies, um, some of which uh, includes him uh, being in part of Auto Luca between '98 to 2001, and also he was a managing partner at Midway Growth Partners for. Uh, about a year and then he was the director of product marketing at uh, ISS which is the mobile camera division uh, at uh, Kodak for about five years uh, and then he's the current CEO and founder of uh, Sherpa Analytics Incorporated. Uh, he would be talking uh, in this session fully about uh, data and how awesome data is. Um, currently he also uh, is uh, a happiness coach. I would like to know more about what uh, all that is about. Uh, and uh, not to mention again, it's not just about his technical skills, but uh, I also see that he's an avid sports enthusiast. So uh, he's somebody who resonates with a lot of people, I believe, in this room. Uh, in fact, today we had promised everybody, uh, Mr. Javagal Srinath, who is a sports legend, but an equally great sports enthusiast who is on the other side of the pavilion is here today. So I welcome Mr. Ch Sanjeev Chandrasekhar to delight us all with his experience. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, greetings, fellow entrepreneurs. It is always a delight to come to Mysore, my hometown. Even though I have made uh, Palo Alto my current hometown, but this is my real motherland and hometown. Also, I want to start by thanking Sudanwa, my good friend uh, from a long time, and also want to thank every one of you. Why data analytics is changing the world and why 
that's one of the new frontiers that most of the young folks here can look up to, either for career or uh, to actually build a company. So we'll go there. And you probably recognize uh, quite a few of these uh, superstars. And it's not just the story of data revolution, but also story of sports analytics is what I want to share. And uh, growing up, I really wanted to be a sports person, but I truly lacked any talent. I had no hope. Uh, so I continued and I happened to meet uh, somebody around 2010. And I saw this uh, Barack Obama's election was primarily one because of uh, analytics. And you all may remember in 528, uh, Nate Silver became a worldwide figure. Uh, he not only used uh, analytics to, to understand what the elections are, but he actually drove some of the actionable uh, insights. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So I will introduce some concept uh, as we go along. I'll make it light, it won't be heavy reading, but I'll try to give examples so that you can relate to it rather than just thinking uh, in abstract terms. Uh, I always try to make one commitment. Okay, this one, let's see. So before we begin, I want to make one commitment to you. And that is, we'll try not to use any boring jargons, no memes or cliches, and hopefully no teaching so that you won't sleep. Mm -hmm. So this, I had this for a, an interesting seminar I did. The Microsoft had organized a high school uh, seminar for India for AIML. I was again delighted to know that the artificial intelligence and uh, me and the AIML, the machine learning things are starting so early and I was very delighted to hear that Sudharma schools also st starting to inculcate this particular discipline of data science. So that was very delightful to me. <coughs> oh sorry. So just a show of hands here, uh, any avid sports fans? Okay. Uh, any data enthusiasts? Okay. So the beauty of this, uh, the concept that of data and sports coming together is an amazing thing and we will tell you the story of how it got there. So before I go there, I just want to clarify some terminologies and concepts because there is a lot of hubris lot of everybody bandies this name machine learning uh, uh, and artificial intelligence just like the other word strategy so everybody says we need to have a strategy for even to go to a restaurant that we're all gathered together oh, let's have a strategy now everything is uh, machine learning wherever i go it's amazing uh, but one more thing i'll say is i don't want to use the jargons that are used by the industry to bore you so i'll use something from an entrepreneurial perspective what works what definitions make meaning to us the uh, common people i will try to use that so a couple of uh, key concepts see what happens is when you whenever you do or delve into a data analytics enterprise uh, exercise domain matters the domain knowledge matters because you're normally building a data analytics architecture or a company for a specific domain domain i mean is vertical segment vertical market segment so if you're building something for healthcare you would want to understand the domain of that healthcare again sports the same thing and there are metrics that matter and the metrics that don't matter. So it, the key for success is to understand the domain, the domain metadata, we call it, who are the players, the ecosystem, and more importantly, metrics, because we're talking about the data that is coming out of the domain or that's been stored historically for years or decades. So we'll talk about that. So the other thing, there is always this tension between um, statistical analysis and the quote-unquote machine learning, artificial intelligence, or deep learning, etc. So there's always a tension. So the old statistical or the traditional statistical people, st people from statistics background, are referred to as this old people or the traditionalists. And then the new guys are considered like this machine learning new kids on the block, but there is a lot of overlap. So both methods deal with using data to answer two kinds of questions. There are two kinds of unknowns. One is dealing with the known unknowns, so you know what unknowns that you're looking after. There, a lot of statistical methods will actually apply. But let's say you don't even know what you don't know. So what do we do? So we have a simple answer, ask the data. 
So we'll give you some examples and it'll become uh, clearer, actually. Another thing that always gets confused is uh, this continuum. Analytics is not just a single point, right? So it uh, starts from descriptive ana analytics uh, to predictive analytics to prescriptive. So I'll give you a simple example. So if historical results of election results, if you want to look at. So you could use uh, just regular descriptive analysis. So your questions that you may be asking is, how many people vote, well, how many people, what percentage of people actually exercise the franchise, and um, what is it, how many districts have uh, how many votes, and a lot of things you can do, look at the background. But most of it is descriptive, you, you, now everybody has fancy charts. But what the other little bit next step would be, you must have seen now, whatever used to happen in the US, uh, now it happens everywhere in the world. One is, uh, after the election, just after the election or during the election itself or just before the election, they will conduct polls. And do, using the polls, they will predict what the result is, would be. But what Nate Silver and Fox did was take it to the next level. Now, let's look at the past. Again, the goal there was, how do we influence the electorate so that they could elect Barack Obama and it was a very high challenge and we never thought in our lifetime we would see a, a colored person getting elected and we were all delighted but there was a lot of lingering doubts. So Barack Obama and his team hired this data scientist and they said we are not going to leave any stones unturned. So they actually looked at so much data they were able to pinpoint and actually design and optimize an orchestrated campaign that was widely successful. They were, and the McCain campaign and uh, uh, Mitt Romney's campaign later on had no clue what was happening. What was happening? How, how did this ever happen? They thought last minute, see the white folks may decide, okay, we can't trust a colored person and vote, but it was ruled out. So that way you can see the progression of analytics, but all of them are interesting and important. So even in our journey, I will describe where we use the descriptive analysis analytics, where we use the, the predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. But today's focus will be primarily on the last two stage. So now let's look at um, <clears throat> a couple of more key concepts. See, if you want to solve two different kinds of problems, you can use different methods. Neither one is superior to other or anything, it's just a different mechanism. For example, if you look at the Indian Premier League, um, does anybody watch? Can, you, can I show a hand? So it's uh, pretty good and actually a yeah, reasonable number of people watch. It has taken the world by storm. It has made cricket worldwide phenomenon. I know some of my old friends think that this is not cricket, this is really like a blasphemy and so on, but it is our cricket. It's not the British colonialized cricket, but we have taken it, we molded it, and we made it world famous. And now this is IPLE's cricket. So. There, one of the things that they do is they select a bunch of, there's a, fri a bunch of fr franchises, you will, each franchise gets to select some t uh, uh, new players every year, and the players come to auction, and how do you uh, select uh, a player, con uh, how do you select the roster? So there we have to use uh, what we call the big data analytics. So there the, what we are looking at is, we don't know this new person, who has come to the, uh, the auction. We have never seen him in uh, IPL, but we have seen him in the past. He has uh, a lot of stats that he has accumulated. How do we now re evaluate that? So basically we build models. We collect all the data that we can possibly get about the player, uh, his bio data, where he came from, what was his training, what is his strength, uh, weaknesses. Is he a left-hander, right-hander, what kind of bowler, batsman he is. And then we build models we, where we predict and then we prescribe. So what the prediction part is, okay, we predict this particular person is like Virat Kohli kind of a player. This person is more like Tandulkar kind of a player. This person, this new player is coming in is more like uh, uh, the DK, what's his uh, name? Uh, Dinesh Karthik, yeah, kind of a player. Because in IPL, it's a very short duration. A lot of things happen in uh, rapid succession. And you have to build some analytic systems that not only support pre-game, in-game, and post-game analytics. And not only that, pre-season analytics. So that is a, a big area where uh, I'm guessing and I'm hoping that most of the franchises already use. The other thing is once you have selected, you need to do player compensation. 
but you ha so player compensation when you design a player compensation you want to make sure that you have some basic pay based on their reputation and other stuff then you have performance pay and then you have uh, the third is brand value so Virat Kohli is of the world you have to give them something so that they attract crowds so we'll talk about Virat Kohli a little bit in the next uh, session so what happens is in IPL franchises they look at the data for all over the last 15 years of data now you have and they look at and they say okay based on this all the data that we have collected now Virat Kohli coming into this year he is worth this much so they paid him actually 15 crore or something like that the highest paid but and then there was another person in um, uh, Chahal or somebody in uh, Tamil Nadu uh, CSK he didn't even play a game so they ended up playing uh, so much money for them so now you have to have insurance and other stuff but again the point is it is hard to create a good value good uh, package that you need and a lot of people think oh we have expertise we are we are experts we know what we are doing but a lot of times you if you look at the way that they were selected their allocation of the resource which is a uh, cash into across all the different players is not optimal i mean the studies after studies we can show that it is a terrible way that they have spent and the allocation of resources and allocation of the talent is bad so again that's another area where we will uh, look at a traditional olap so now let's start the actual feature presentation so today's uh, objectives, the main objective is to talk about the energy that has been created by data analytics revolution in general. Then we'll look at the market opportunity for the sports analytics. And then we'll look at the story of sports analytics startup. Before I do that, I want to double click on a few things. See, we are all entrepreneurs. We have great opportunities when there is a great technological revolution and we at least our generation, some of the, the folks who have lived for longer have had the fortune of living through some serious great revolutions that change the world. So people say technology revolutions change the world, but I have a small corollary, but the entrepreneurs who seize the opportunity and take the risk will change the world, not the technology revolution. Technology revolution would have been science revolution, invention or discoveries, but you need to take, and again, you should give yourself a big applause at least we belong to that category. We try. We may not succeed, but if we, enough people succeed, some people will continue. So now let's look at, and constantly entrepreneurs are born and they ask, what is the next big one? So that's where I come to the three great technologies, revolutions that are happening simultaneously, that is transforming the world today. And we hope that in the next uh, 10 years, or 20 years, world will be completely unrecognizable. That's the goal. Uh, hopefully some in good, mostly in good ways, but we can't avoid the other side. So I have a question for you. One thing that is common to, uh, that was not common to this, say this, if you look at it, it's all something specific. So what is something that is common to all these three things? One is the nanotechnology revolution, internet of things, then the data revolution. Any takers? Yes. Perfect. You, you hit the jackpot. So this applies to across the board, all walks of life, all vertical markets will be affected by this. So that, and especially data. So I, since I'm going to speak about that, I'm going to pitch a little bit more on data. I've worked on two others, but this is my favorite. We'll do a double click on that. See, um, as Matt, your name, Matt? Uh, Sri Lakshmi pointed out, it affects all the vertical sectors. And I'm sure people here have come from various different sectors, be it healthcare, finance, or digital security, or transportation, even sports is going to be changed. So I hope some of you guys may not be doctors, but you have some connection, some passion in curing diseases, you'll work on that. Some of the other folks may be interested in security, you'll work on those. But all these things, have data-based solutions, means there are enough data in the world that if you slice and dice the data, you will get insights that you can't even imagine. So we'll talk about a few, uh, few of those examples. So now let's just double click a little bit on analytics rev revolution in the sports. Most people may not know, it's what, uh, at least in Europe and US, it's almost 7% of the economy is sports and entertainment 
and about two three percent but in in terms of sheer volume it's a pretty big thing about almost 170 billion dollar industry and over one billion fans so every one out of seven is a sports fan and it's serious business and it is data rich it's very very important that we have a lot of data it actually started with uh, us who have kept the data of I will show you some of the things that they've kept. It will be fun to watch. So now let's look at the, uh, the other thing that I've seen is everybody, um, now that IPL is big, everybody says, oh, IPL is the biggest in the world. It's going to take over the world. Maybe one day. In terms of number of viewers, number of fans, absolutely. But if you look at the overall spectrum, the US still dominates. NFL dominates by far. If you look at the next two, NBA and um, Major League together, it will be about NFL. And NFL is as big as the four or top three to four European leagues. And recently, Ganguly said um, IPL is overtaken EPL, which actually has not, but one day, maybe. But it is one of the fastest growing fields. So let's look at what's happening in the IPL. So in the IPL, I mentioned briefly in my introductory remarks. So the predictive analytics, I'll focus initially on the predictive analytics that is happening in the franchise world. I mean, in the, the big companies like KKR, RCB, Mumbai Indians, etc. So they are already using my, some intelligence that I have on this is uh, play evaluation, team building process that we mentioned. There are a lot of uh, methods available that if, uh, if you have enough data, you can come to some very good conclusions. So they do that. Then it's also used in pre-game and in-game and post-game. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the things that happens is just the pre-game, You, the go, people go for a toss. So when you win the toss, do you want to select a bat? Do you want to bat first? Do you want to bat second? In uh, IPL, there are only 20 overs. So, and that decision is very critical. You may look at the weather, you may look at the humidity, you may look at the kind of uh, team that you're facing, you think that they are a weak batting team and you're relatively strong batting team, you go first. Or is it a day game or evening game? So I actually watch uh, NFL, uh, IPL games with uh, four or five uh, WhatsApp groups uh, because I want to know how are they viewing because they are my consumers, the fans. So I, we do um, real-time predictions. Every uh, over, every three overs, we'll say what will be the score, who is on track to win. So most people, uh, almost 100 million of in India, think that they know more cricket than most of the people who are actually managing the show. Hats off to them. I'm sure all of us think that way, and that is good. But they make statements uh, that are not supported by data. So I point out to them and they say, oh, no, no, you, there is no question in my mind. You have to start bat second. Why? The data doesn't support that. So it is 50-50. And if you look at the day games, it is 60-40. 60, 60 times, 60% of the time, you go first. And if you go to Australia, BBL, it's a different ball game. It's a uh, mentality. They want to start first. They want to put an imposing total. But here, they want to play defense. But it is changing. But the fact is, we have data on 1,000 games. It's 50-50. The fact that you win a game, you win the toss, you better bat well or you better bowl well. So now comes the in-game preparation. So during the game, as the game is evolving, because it's such a fast game, it's just uh, uh, 20 overs, will just pass just like that and every over counts. Now suddenly the first two overs, Virat Kohli is out, this guy is out, Faf Duplessis is out, like five guys are out in 56 for five. So they have no hope. Then Dinesh Karthik comes and he bangs and we may win. So the people that are managing in the dugouts or whatever, playpens, they have to plan. They are using computers today. Okay, now this disaster has happened or this glorious thing has happened. What do we do? Or somebody comes and hits four sixers. So what does this guy do? He has no hope. I mean, his confidence is completely shattered. So Dhoni of the world will come and give him the Bhishma advice or something. But not everybody is Dhoni, who has probably has everything that we have in the data in his head. So they panic. And the other thing that happens is two more balls remaining. You have to hit two sixers. And some guy who is a professional league bowler allows that guy to hit two sixers. And balls, no ball in between. 
So how do you control this kind of stuff? So what happens is, what we are saying is, we are not saying this analytics will replace humans. It is a great tool to have. You already have insights, you are already a domain experts, and now you can use this as an additional guide. What does data say? You can always ask. So that is one example that I will give a specific example. How are we doing with time actually? It is, uh, okay. So <laughs> I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So uh, there was uh, last year coming into the season, uh, Virat Kohli was expected to play well. RCB, they said, finally it will no, no longer be RCB TV, RCB TV, but it will at least we get a chance. RCB is like uh, what some people call uh, bridesmaid. They are constantly bridesmaid. They never get married. They go to the finals, they go to the wedding, they just receive the bouquet and never get married. But now, this year, with fast duplicity at this uh, helm, we thought, okay, we're going to win. So, Virat Kohli was expected to play. He's having a disastrous season. So, I asked my friends, good friends, what do we do? Everybody has an advice. Oh, they should drop him. Somebody says he should honorably discharge himself. That's not going to happen. That's not actionable insight. So, we said, we'll design an experiment. We have enough data, we'll put the data in and we'll ask the, uh, the models. So the models came out with a simple thing. So instead of him going at the top of the order, he should go down the order. Instead, he went the other way. He was playing second or third, he goes first. Are you kidding me, man? And then he's out first over. Sometimes like second ball, he's run out. Kavaskar is saying, how can this happen? But because it can, because people think through emotion. So we said, so what our thing said is it should go low down and why is that? Why did the model say? Because the model looked at what happens when you go in the first. Because you have the whole load on you that you can't give up. But whereas if he comes later in the innings, you have an opportunity that game is little bit set, the bowlers are tired and he is a damn good player. He just needs that one small edge. And he goes there every time he's getting out, the pressure is building. So we said, this is the thing. Oh, that's not going to happen. But obviously, he's not going to resign. He's not going to just walk out. Himself. He's still playing. At least he's in the roster. right? So that's an example of where data actually does a better job. And with data, you can show him why we think so. We can show the examples of previous instances where these things have actually worked. So he may be more amenable instead of asking him to please leave on his own and also the RCB guys have paid 15 crore and they should know better that it's a sunk cost. So you cannot just continue to think about that but they are not able to get out, get past that. So let's go to a few more uh, short recaps. So we did the analytics uh, revolution in general. We clicked a little bit on sports franchises. Let's look at the the fan gaming market. So where we come in. So we knew that uh, in the 1990s the analytics changed the world of franchise sports, especially baseball. Then in 2000s, Moneyball also, and there was, it was called Moneyball Revolution. There was a movie about it. It's a beautiful movie about how the, the way that they started recruiting changed, the, uh, changed and they continued to win. So Moneyball 2.0, this is my nomenclature, happened in 2000 when uh, football started using analytics. So what we are doing is what we call Moneyball 3.0. We're not changing the sports franchises because nobody uh, knows who we are and nobody may listen unless until we become really good like uh, Nate Silver. So we said, can we provide some analytics support for fans? So we called ourselves Sherpa for one uh, reason. So we said, what do Sherpas do? They do heavy lifting. Not physical, but they also carry a lot of uh, institutional knowledge with them. They have been doing that for 600 years and they where the sensors don't work or where a lot of things fail when people can't even uh, breathe there's like 10 percent oxygen level these guys can take you there lift those uh, the loads for the other guys and make the dream of the mountaineers actually happen so we said we will do the analytics heavy lifting for you guys so that you can focus you the mountaineers can focus on your expertise that you claim that you have so we not only give you that option to you, we bring the same level of analytics rigor and options that a ESPN would have or some big companies would have or franchises would have. Then you will make the decision and we will record, you can enter your predictions, you can say what 
the play calling you can call your own shots you enter and then at the end of the day we'll show you okay your cha your roster that you picked would have been better than csk so we'll make that happen for you so by doing that so if you look at the the size of this market is just incredible just the fan gaming market not even the franchise we believe that betting market and the fantasy game market will overtake the franchise revenues it is already done in uh, us and other places betting revenues is almost three times the revenue of uh, thing and we i personally was against betting so we created something called funny money betting it's like a monopoly money so as i said the domain is very important we spent a lot of time in the first 2016 to 19 i still had a f oh, thank you yeah so uh, 2016 to 19 i was still working and i was building models for cisco so i had a chance and i collected a whole bunch of data i got really excited about making this uh, moneyball 3.0 so we spent a lot of time collecting huge amount of data i'll show you a little bit snippets of that then you will recognize what it is then i said uh, we will have to be, and then i started uh, predicting the games so every week um, in nfl there are 256 games over a period of 16 weeks every week there are 16 games 32 teams i we started predicting and i started sending out my models prediction to all my friends then they said man this is pretty good uh, i thought i'll get a phd and teach uh, data science in sports then i said there's money to be made here one of my friends said maybe you should start a company so i said no no before we do that let's test out in in a regular season so the next season uh, 2019 I started publishing every single game prediction on Facebook. So, lo and behold, I thought I asked God uh, at least let me be in the top five, ten percent. Uh, so there are like fifteen hundred people predicting, uh, and so at the end of the season, we were looking at it. Okay, the first week we were number one. Second week, we were, now this can't be true. So we went and checked the model. Is my, this model is working? Because we, I didn't want to believe something that was not, not true. so we year week after week week and the season ended normally the the prediction accuracy is about 66% in a gaussian distribution or a poisson distribution so we hit 70 so okay beginners luck but it was a long period of time also that particular year was a statistically well behaved year so what does it mean so we predict based on the statistics and these guys are delivering on statistics that doesn't normally happen if your average score on a day is 50 and if you deliver like some days you deliver 50 some days you deliver 70 some days you score 20 runs but an average if you deliver your your expected average that is hugely uh, well behaved statistical year so that happened we beat uh, vegas we beat espn sports we beat fox car so fox sports that was something so then we said no no this is serious so we need to build a company so i hired a company uh, one of our friends uh, one of my previous investors suggested that uh, we were we had built an app to do some testing we had built a test harness uh, we built a uh, fantasy app we built a betting app we built a, a bracket app and he said man this guys have potential but this ain't going anywhere because this looks like a graduate students project and you need the professional help so we sought professional and they came in and we started uh, let me lift the hood and show you what was happening underneath what happened until now so again you start with a lot of data it can be paid some of them are paid some of them are uh, un uh, some of them are free open source and then we apply something called the etl that extract transform load the generic uh, data warehousing constructs and concepts then we have to store the data in a data lake so the data lake we took all the data ingested the data cleansed it tagged it baselined it and characterized it found all the specific distributions and uh, decompositions etc and for the first time i was using everything that i had learned eigen vectors Oh, all the things that i had learned i never thought i would ever use these things uh, poisson distribution bernoulli distribution that was music to my ears growing up uh, uh, my dad was a nuclear physicist he always loved mathematics and i loved but i was not that good but i loved mathematics no so that helped me so now we have this data 
50 years of data. I'll show you a snippet of what the data looked like about 20 years ago. Okay, then, okay, now what, okay. So, I made a comment that uh, in the US they've maintained data since the 1960s. And the 60s, they maintain something called play-by-play -play data. Every play is gap. It's equivalent to ball-by-ball -ball data. Every ball. So we have now collected uh, data for every ball that's ever been bowled uh, on IPL and BBL and World Cup. So that allows you to do a lot of analytics. You know who the bowler was, where the field position was, where did he hit, what where the ball hit first time and all this other fun stuff. So you can see that this is still very well captured. It's uh, fantastic. It is, it is in the uh, NFL Hall of Fame. So now uh, I will zip through a little bit. So now that you have all these things, then you push it through this uh, analytics engine. So that's where we run all these uh, models and the models will spit out insights. The insights will go into these betting apps, fantasy apps, etc. So now one more double click. So this is the factory that we have, Insight Factory which runs on the Kubernetes uh, cluster. And uh, there are container based uh, for storage, container based uh, information for all our infrastructure. And then it spits out, we create APIs and eventually it will hit, uh, hit the mobile app. So now one small note quickly. So other area that we can do, special topics we call it, uh, if you can do a lot more things, not just about the stats, but also about inju injuries. That means now you're delving into a lot of biology, physiology and medicine, sports medicine. So we have a few doctors on our staff that uh, we, uh, we talk to. And that's one of the things that we will do here is if we end up doing that, we will hire some folks here. So we actually publish uh, what we call Sherpa Injury 360 for every player, for every position, uh, for NFL and key games. So what is next for Sherpa? We expect to launch our mobile app and subscription service for the next upcoming season for NFL, IPL and March Madness. These are all heavy gunning uh, opportunities for us to uh, test it up. So time to wrap up. So take away and call to action. One thing I will say, data revolution is going to affect all aspects of life. So choose your passion, whether it's healthcare, whether it's sports, whether it's anything. So go after that and I'm guaranteeing you that your generation will transform. But don't be a bystander, be an active person. Take the risk, you can fail. 80-90% of us will fail, but at least we know that we tried. So again, uh, I just want to leave this, this I can leave it later, I can, I can leave some of the slides. So how do I get in? You don't have to start a company. You can actually look at various career opportunities in an existing startup. We offer actually internships for young kids, even as, as uh, young as high school kids. And they can come and then they can explore. So now uh, Q&A, uh, I was told that we'll do it. I hope I didn't take too much time uh, on time. Thank you. Again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you Sanjeev sir uh, for that. I don't know, Sanjeev, sir, uh, you, if, if the AI model, what you've built, I don't know if it's in a stage where it can really predict when, you know, our beloved team RCB will win, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I hope, you know, some, someday uh, it comes to the prediction, yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to the next speaker, uh, Jayant Sharma, so, uh, you know, renowned photographer, coach, uh, so I, I request others to give a quick introduction. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, I hope all of you had a really engaging and an insightful session. Now we move from engaging and insightful to something exploratory and something, you know, in the wildlife which is going to come here on stage. Uh, I'm so excited uh, personally and also from the capacity of time, I to uh, welcome Jayant Sharma here uh, on stage. Uh, in fact, I like uh, to hear from him so much that I, I won't be introducing much of him. So Jayant Sharma, sir, the stage is all yours. Uh, he's a wildlife enthusiast and a multi-country award winner and uh, he has been a techie who has turned into uh, a naturalist, a wildlife photographer and an entrepreneur. So let's welcome Mr. Jayant here on stage. Uh, also later go and follow his Instagram handle. He has about a lakh and a half follower plus and uh, I think uh, sir, the stage is yours. Uh, 
I, I, I probably think I'll uh, be very honest in what I want to say here. Um, I actually do not think entrepreneurship is something which um, even relates to my ancestors or even my father or, you know, to an extent uh, nobody in my family even dreamt of doing something um, where you run your own business and stuff like that. So what I want to do here is um, tell you a little bit about my background because that's what this topic is about, creativity. Um, and I want to tell you about some of the things that I have done in my last 12 years of being an entrepreneur or at least trying to be one. A lot of uh, amazing things that have happened um, and most importantly, especially since I know there are a lot of uh, maybe students or people who have just begun, you know, uh, getting into this world of uh, being an entrepreneur, I'd like to share some of my learnings, especially coming from um, a perspective of a creative or let's say an artist or somebody who um, uh, does a lot of interesting things which are visually attractive and uh, with that comes a lot of um, amazing problems to solve. So uh, let me first learn how to use this. So the front one is the one which goes ahead. Let's try. Uh, There's a new device for me. Just hold on a second. Okay, great. Um, so I was born in a family in Mysore, one couple. My um, father was absolutely... Uh, into art of many kinds. He was a dramatist, he was a painter, he was an All India Radio uh, auditioned artist. Uh, he also was a very established and award-winning photographer. And right from childhood, I always used to hear this uh, as somebody who was creative as a child myself. For example, um, let me first tell you what this means. It means Sangeeta Sahitya Kalavihinaha Sakshat Pashuhu Puchha Vishanahinaha. I'm not by heart at this, I've been knowing this from school. What this means is, if a human being is not interested in art, music, dance, literature, or any kind of creative arts, uh, the person is an animal without a tail. Uh, in other words, um, you know, it's a little harsh, but that's what true artists believe, that they want to in inculcate some kind of an artistic habit in their uh, younger generation, and that's how I have been brought up as a child. So, um, as a child, I was into Carnatic classical music. I was the only boy sitting amidst 20 girls doing Sri Gananatha and all of that, putting Adi Tada. Uh, it was quite embarrassing then for a seven, eight year old boy, but I started enjoying it later when I was 15, 16. Uh, I was into art, I was into music, I was into dramatics, a lot of artistic things. I never was somebody who had ambitions of, hey, 95% want to be the second rank, first rank and all of that. Uh, in fact, my father also, brought me up in such a way that if I didn't win the Kannada recitation contest or the fancy dress contest or the drama contest, it would be a lot more hurtful than getting 75 out of 100 or 80 out of 100 kind of a thing. So just giving you my background as a child, uh, today um, this is what, um, sorry for the slides getting a little messed up because I had to change my resolution. So um, I am actually a wildlife photographer. In, in my terms, I'd like to call myself a natural history photographer because when you take a landscape photo, people might not associate that with wildlife. But anything which is from the natural world is what I photograph. I'll share some of my uh, reasons of why I do that so that it's interesting for people who want to begin. I'm a brand ambassador of some of the brands which align with my business. Like I'm a Sony artisan, which means Sony India uses me to promote their brands. I also evangelize with brands like BenQ, which make photography monitors. I also evangelize with HP for their large format fine art printing uh, printers as well. I run a small company uh, called Toehold. Uh, like the Sherpa, the Toehold also is uh, something which uh, helps people climb greater heights and I'll tell you more about that. So today as a wildlife uh, a photographer, um, I have been to almost uh, six continents of the world and in each continent many many different countries where I have done some work So before I begin telling you my story. I want to just show you my footprint on the globe uh, I am a little conscious of a couple of gentlemen sitting here in the front bench who know me a little more intimately Some of them have traveled with me some of them do photography themselves So please bear with some of the things that I say you already know very well So there are two kinds of wildlife photographers or at least there are two kinds of wildlife photos that people can make um, the first one is something I call a documentary photograph. For example, I go underwater in the Andamans or the Maldives or, you know, let's say some beautiful, you know, uh, 
area where there are coral reefs and marine life underwater. And I can make photos and bring back some artistic pictures, but I also can make some photos like these. Now, these are pictures which are far away from pretty pictures. These are pictures which are hard hitting. These are pictures which are needed to tell stories, to change many things, or maybe to make people conscious and stuff like that without being preachy. Uh, this is just an example of a documentary photographer. At the same time, with the same camera, same place, same area, I can make photos like these as well. Now, I want you to understand the two kinds of photographers and who I am. I realized I want to be this kind of a photographer because I make photographs for the common man and my um, uh, joining the dots was what am I supposed to do? I'm not a biologist, I'm not a scientist, I do not have that hardcore science background but I do have an ability to connect with people and what do I need to show to people is beautiful pictures of things that they may not see themselves. If they want to, they're most welcome to join me on expeditions and see that as well. But otherwise, somebody sitting in Bangalore, Mysore may not see some of these stuff. So the first goal was to show them some amazing things about the world. And that's how I began doing photography as a hobby. Now, over the period of uh, last 12, 13 years, I started using multiple skill sets I had as a young man. Um, as I said, creativity, being an artist, or getting into different forms of art. I'm a higher grade drawing, um, you know, graduate as well. I have done my exams in drawing. Uh, I have had uh, different kinds of, uh, uh, what can I say, experiences with different forms of arts as well. So today what I do is I make pictures which are just pretty. So why do we need to make that? I'll tell you in a bit. So for example, this is a photograph of a polar bear in the Arctic. And uh, I am standing on the hull of my ship. If you remember Leonardo DiCaprio, that spot, just that instead of Kate Winslet, I had my camera. Uh, and there's a, there's a beautiful bear which is walking um, against uh, the ship. And this is a beautiful photo made using a specific kind of a lens for people who are into photography. Apart from these two gentlemen, anybody else into photography? Please raise your hands. Okay, great. So this is a fisheye lens which I used. It's an award-winning picture. Made me really proud when I got this. Uh, I have been working in the Arctic a lot for an Indian photographer, especially Bangalore Mysore guy. Uh, spending so many years in the Arctic is not really a normal thing and that's what I want to tell you guys um, as something that made me a little different from the rest of the crop in this world was uh, one of the lessons I was truly inspired by uh, management lesson. It's called the Blue Ocean Strategy. So I basically really took to that very seriously and realized how would I be different from hundreds of people who are doing photography is one, by doing it differently or by going to different places than what they are doing. And that's one of the lessons I learned and started becoming somebody who people started recognizing in the field of photography. Um, Arctic is one of my most um, uh, favorite places. In less than 20 days, I'll be there hopefully if uh, everything is all right. So I also happen to get a lot of success in Africa. I enjoy photographing wildlife in Africa. It, it's, it's like Tawaruru for me. Um, in, in fact, uh, last uh, 15 years, I have been 48 times to East Africa alone. Last couple of years have been the lowest uh, I have traveled to. In fact, Ajit uh, and I were there uh, maybe five, six years ago. We had some great time in Africa as well. Uh, so, uh, in India, of course, a lot of areas where tigers are abundant is where we operate a lot because now it's not only about what I like to do, I'm also running a business where I should consider my market, my audience, what they want to do and some of my products are also aligned with the market uh, expectation as well. So, but if you ask me personally, I enjoy photographing any natural, um, you know, subject like for example, a bird, animal, frog, insect, landscape anything for that matter which is a part of our natural world artistically and that's what I do. For example, if you look at this photograph, a lot of you might think, ayo, Photoshop matter beko. So this is actually not Photoshopped. It is shot like this on the field using technique in the camera without getting into the camera techniques. So I try my best to be an artist using a camera. That's why it's called photo art. And also wherever possible, I'd like to see something which four or five other guys standing next to me may not be seeing, which is not obvious. So that needs multiple skills. One is uh, imagination, one is creativity, and also technical finesse, and also having a, a thorough knowledge of, you know, things like your camera, techniques, what, what mode to use when, when should you, and also being, um, you know, not too overexcited. It happens when there's a tiger in front of you that people are like, <laughs> 
that is that is not going to help you be a little creative you need to calm down and you basically need to think how can you make a shot which is unique which you have not made last weekend because it's going to add to your database sometimes un unwanted data is only filling the you know a hard disk as well so that is something which i strive to do without showing you too many uh, photos of pretty pictures i want to tell you what i am here for this is also a beautiful picture which helps me um, communicate uh, some of the stories with the audience um, birds are one of the most widely uh, loved subjects a lot of people uh, enjoy watching pretty pictures of birds which happens to be one of my most uh, um, sold prints as well uh, underwater is my passion uh, but a lot of underwater photography doesn't have the mass appeal yet because it doesn't have the tiger lion or stuff like that but people who will start understanding wildlife really cherish a lot of wildlife so why professional wildlife photography i i could be doing photography as a hobbyist uh, just to give you a background i was um working in the technology uh, space i have been a graphic designer i was a web designer in excel soft some 19 years ago um i moved to a company called accenture i i, I ended my career in the it industry being a user experience designer so that gave me a lot of important lessons in life of uh, not just the artistry because you know designer means you need to be creative and also understanding the user the empathy the customer and all of that added a lot of uh, knowledge to me which was more practical and what i have been doing all these years even after my it career has been implementing those lessons in my present day field as well so why professional photography why not just do it as a hobby and enjoy it on a friday saturday uh, sunday because one is i was so passionate about uh, photography and uh, wildlife um, many people in the media started writing about me quitting it job and doing photography for the first few years to be honest i was every time fed up of those interviews because i could never quit it i don't think anybody can quit it what they meant was he quit working in an it industry but that is not true i work on it every day even today if you open my laptop there'll be uh, an ftp connected there'll be some kind of a you know uh, stuff i'm doing i'm on ssh working on some shell scripts or something like that so uh, once a techie cannot refrain from being one forever but i was passionate about wildlife and i really uh, wanted to do it more i was not fed up of my it job i just wanted to do this more which is why i took a decision about quitting it and i had the environment of art and photography and so it was just falling in place during 2003 is when the digital cameras came into existence and that was when the market started opening up very soon i started winning awards got published and i started realizing you know i i'm i'm actually reasonably okay good in doing all this so i should probably do this as a wildlife photographer uh, without you know lot of thought an audacious 25 26 year old guy's decision i quit my job and i came to mysore 11 o'clock am shatabdi i still remember that uh, saturday morning i came and told my mom i have quit my job i am serving my notice period and they were like yo accenture bitputia and i was like it took 3 hours to convince them why and then even though my father is a photographer he was not sure i was doing the right thing uh, because they were very proud of my id card and mnc alin the vekaro loans igatte always credit card companies are outside your building all of that was happening uh but then life was about to change so then um the one, one of the reasons why i wanted to do photography full time was because i wanted to do it more often regularly consistently and i also since i had to do it more often it had to be rewarding financially as well so i decided i'll do it full time i had no idea i had nobody to learn from uh, apart from krupakar sinani one of the famous filmmakers in mysore i had nobody else that i had to look up to and they were also going through a transformation because digital photography had just come into the world hundreds and hundreds of photographers were you know um, starting to get into photography so i started doing freelance wildlife photography and in less than a year i realized i'm not good i'm not going to get anywhere being a photographer uh, who takes pictures of lions and tigers and stuff like that i want to ask you people how many of you bought a photograph to decorate your house wall okay 4 5 6 7 okay and um, the the story is a lot of people don't buy i realized very soon in my own endeavor of being a photographer that when we used to do exhibitions in 2002 2003 people would come and say wow beautiful photograph i would love to buy this for my board room or for my house or, my, or for my wall time started changing and in 2007 8 9 10 people would come and see that and say amazing line where did you shoot this africa i would love to go one day and shoot this myself you see the way mind was changing in people so i started observing that and very soon i realized many things about 
being a, a businessman, being an entrepreneur, and I'll share some of those ideas with you. One of the most interesting things I do is sell prints. So I make these beautiful pictures, as I said, and I sell them as fine art prints. Even there, the first lesson I had was to differentiate between something called a limited edition print versus an open edition print, which means it could be the same picture, by just telling my audience that I will only print 15 of these in my life ever, I'm creating a, a rarity there. I'm creating a limited quantity of that commodity. Thereby, I, couldn't, I could I mean, expect a little more price for that. Instead of that, if I could make thousands and thousands of copy, uh, copies of the same photo, if you're walking on Brigade Road in M MG Road, you'll see the photo on the roadside, you'll not get inspired to buy that, paying $400, $500 and things like that. So the first lesson was to limit the quantities of whatever I had to make in order to attract a premium for that. So that is what I do, sell fine art prints. But as you know, a lot many people don't buy fine art prints. And to be honest, even if I sell a lot of prints, for the kind of investment that goes into uh, traveling to these places, going to the Arctic, $10,000 of exp expedition, coming back with 25 photographs, divide 10,000 by 25 and your time value and all of that, you will not really make business sense. Even a high school you know, a, a person can tell you that it's not adding up, right? So then I started thinking, what should I do? That's where it brings me to today's topic. Uh, in fact, I have two um, perceptions of today's topic. When I put up, I also took a poll on my own Instagram uh, out of 150,000 people, about 800 people participated in this poll. I asked people, what do you think I'm going to talk about when I say creativity and entrepreneurship? Uh, am I going to talk about entrepreneurs like all of you or some of you who want to become, becoming creative in whatever they do? Or people like me who were creative into dance, drama, music, theater, that this and everything wants to become entrepreneurs. What do you think I want to talk about was the poll I put across. A lot of people said both. Uh, a lot of people said, I think knowing you, you would probably speak about the second one because you haven't achieved anything great to preach people about how to be a creative entrepreneur. I said, absolutely right. Uh, I am actually still in the learning phase of being an entrepreneur myself. I still started learning how to read a balance sheet seven, eight years ago, three, four years after starting my business. Uh, so I am still learning to be a creative entrepreneur. But I think I have a lot of lessons, even though I have not implemented all of those lessons, I at least have learned lessons of how any creative person can start looking at his or her passion of art or whatever it is and start putting some kind of a business model or a plan to it and give it a fair chance of making it work. So first of all, let's understand, all of you must know what is entrepreneurship. This is a definition by a professor who teaches entrepreneurship. And he says the creation of opportunity and value with an intent to profit financially, but not just that, socially or otherwise through the assumption of risk and effort. There's nothing new that we learn from this, right? So I wanted to figure out what of these things that we do, which is true. So by the way, my company is called Toehold. So Toehold is relatively lesser used term in India. We all know foothold. So foothold um, is a, uh, I mean, a smaller version of a foothold is a toehold. When somebody is climbing a mountain, they need a Sherpa for sure, but they need a toehold to climb on to the rock as well. So that is what toehold is. So uh, that's what we do. So what do we do quickly, please? I don't want to tell you too many things about uh, our business so that it gives you an idea. One is we are into photography education. Why did I get into photography education? I realized I'm not going to make too much money selling the pictures of tigers that I shoot because the buyers are less. You remember the world was changing into a, a, a scenario where there are more people saying, I want to click my own picture. So I realized I'll use my knowledge to not make commodities, but to tell people how to shoot photographs. And this is one of our most successful business parts, that business units, where we teach photography. Just for records, last week we counted 14,300 people have learned photography from us in the last 12 years. Thank you. Out of which 10,500 was pre-pandemic and it was a super fast growth in the pandemic itself of people we dealt with in the form of Zoom classes and stuff like that. Last year in May, I launched my own app called the Toehold Academy. Anil Kumble launched it and we got a great opening and it was a fantastic uh, second wave for us uh, uh, without being really harsh. <laughs> uh, but then apart from that, we do camera rentals. We provide camera gear on hire. So if you understand so far, we give you knowledge and we give you the gear to implement that knowledge. Third and most important, we take people on photo expeditions across the globe. From Africa to the Arctic, 20 years ago, if a guy from Mysore said he wanted to go to the Arctic, it was a joke. 
But today, there have been hundreds of people who are going to the Arctic because the industry has become like that. People go there like a Nat Geo photographer. If they have learned reasonably good photos, they are competing with the quality and standards of what a Nat Geo photographer can also produce. Lastly, we are also a travel agency who help people manage their wildlife and cultural travels and stuff like that. Now, so far, this is what our company does. Teaching is a very passionate thing that I do, um, as I said. Um, what do we teach in this place is we basically teach technique, science, and we call this course of ours the art and science of photography. Now, the most important thing I want to do today is to share some of my learnings as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur who's trying to be a good one. Um, and uh, let's look at some of the challenges in my perspective, in my opinion, in my uh, experience about what creative people, when they become entrepreneurs, what kind of challenges they may face, which could be almost the same for anybody, but it's definitely very strong for creative people. And the first one is realizing what entrepreneurship means. A lot of us uh, think, um, you know, um, opening a company um, means becoming an entrepreneur. It's very easy to file a company, ROC application and open a company. What, who is an entrepreneur versus who is a self-employed person? Now I look at my own father in the 80, 80 or 75 to about 95, he was employed in the government uh, service, but he also had a photography job where he would go out and take pictures in weddings and assignments and stuff like that. Now, he also had a couple of assistants. Now, I started wondering whether that is what is entrepreneurship. But then I realized the day my dad didn't go to shoot a wedding or he didn't go to make some assignment, there would be no income generated from that endeavor. So the first lesson I learned being an artist is it's not enough if only I am the one who is creating something. So there's a difference between self-employment and becoming a business owner. Many, many of us register a company and do everything ourselves and we call ourselves business owners. So that was the hard truth I learned two years after. But thankfully, I had already started a team and we had people apart from just me. So that's something which any youngster who wants to start a business, you need to realize the first lesson in business is probably you need to uh, look at your goals and not just be the one-man show. Uh, it might sound like you can remote work and do, then you're a freelancer or a self-employed person, not an entrepreneur in the true sense. Now, the second thing I want to understand um, or explain to some of you beginners, I'm sure stalwart sitting here will, will know this like, you know, uh, I mean, 100 times better than me, but I still don't know this in full clarity, but I at least know that I don't know that and I have to um, you know, sponder over this every six months as the world changes. Like the pandemic happened, the business model had to change. From uh, having a banquet hall like this and training people for two days, we shifted it to an app and an online course and stuff like that. So business model, not just while you start the company, evaluate it while, you know, every, every turn of, you know, uh, whatever happens in life. Like for example, five years later, something else may happen where, you know, technology has made us realize we don't even need to learn photography. For example, let's say a camera has become so powerful now that you can program and put GPS coordinates and it can go to Nagarhole and take a photograph of a tiger and come. Who knows it can happen, right? So then what will my business do? We have to figure out how we evolve. So business model, and even in that, this word scale is something that I always heard, but I never truly understood until I started doing business for a few years. Why? Because I'm an artist and I love to create stuff. And when I love to create stuff, I want to create stuff. I don't want to sit back and watch some of my colleagues create it and fine tune it, which means, again, I'm looking at it from a self-employment perspective, um, not from an entrepreneur's perspective. And what happens to people like me who are creative is they enjoy to create it. So they don't really start wondering whether there's somebody who is willing to pay for it. This is one of the biggest problems for creatives. They never wonder, is there a customer willing to pay for what you want to create? They start thinking, I have spent four days to create this. Nobody wants to buy. How rude of this world. So that is something I realized myself. So then that means you need to do stuff. All of these are nothing new to all of you. All of you have heard of this, but I'm just sharing it from my own experience that I learned if I create something, that's why in, I think in technology, they call that MVP or something, uh, minimum viable product or something, right? You create a small version of it, you try it out and you seek feedback and all of that. If it works, then you go for the big shot. Otherwise you realize you've been delusional. You've been passionate. You're only thinking from your perspective. The users don't want it. The customers don't want to pay for it and stuff like that. So those are the things that as an artist, 
it's even worse. If you're a techie itself, it's worse if you don't do an MVP and test your product. For an artist, you're not just creating something, you're deriving pleasure from it. You're feeling like a Picasso there. And when you realize the world doesn't need your piece of art, it's heartbreaking. So it's a lot of practical uh, thinking that needs apart from just being creativity, which comes over time. So other thing I want to talk about is people like me who are from kindergarten to high school to college to uh, you know even employment we are very high on art like for example you must see this presentation and must imagine how much time i took to put it together right so anything i do even an email i want to do it beautifully i want to do it you know that itself is a problem to entrepreneurs right uh, i have realized over time it's a, it's a disease in me that even to make a presentation i can have simple five slides or i can spend half an hour more to make that slide more decorative and appealing why? Because I'm a designer, I'm a creative, I've been a user experience designer, graphic designer. It's great, but sometimes I realize that itself is a disease for me, where I may spend half a day more to deliver the same thing which may serve the same purpose, but because I want to do it more creatively, I waste half a day more, which from a business sense may not make sense sometimes. But talking about the biggest problem is the financial acumen. This is one of the biggest roga some of us creative people have. I won't call it roga, I would probably say deficiency. We don't have it. I have known hundreds of people, especially from my father's circle, who are all artists. Kava students, uh, Chamarajendra uh, Arts, they were uh, students of uh, Lalita Kala Academy. They are excellent artists, but I've met a lot of them who are sitting in a corner and creating. And when you go and meet them and you see their artwork, you're amazed, but they don't have a successful career out of it. They are kind of like I do this so much but nobody wants to see what I do we'll find out why that is because they don't have uh, some of the skills a businessman needs especially from a creative background and I want to share some of those thoughts first of all is creative people are very shy about marketing themselves they are very they, they feel very awkward and when I used to be a child or when I at least used to be in my early 20s when I first time went to Africa my, star, my father put up a paid ad in Star of Mysore saying, Bon Voyage to Africa. I said, Pa, please, what is this? I was very cringing, but my father was super proud of it. But then I realized, why are you doing this? It doesn't make any sense. But that was the way. You must have seen in the 80s, 90s, Bon Voyage was happening every week in Star of Mysore. Nowadays it has stopped because every third person in the road is going to UK, US and everywhere. Now, then I started realizing the importance of spreading good messages about you right if you don't do this nobody's going to do that so artists are a little shy about saying they are good some of them are people who overdo it saying they are the best nobody's as good as them which is also the problem but most of us are a little shy to say we uh, do this as well and apart from that one of the things i noticed very early right from day one i have solved this in fact amongst all the bullet points here this is probably my strongest uh, where i have reasonably done well fared well uh, I think second class, the rest of them I'm just passed or maybe failed in some as well. Um, I realized the need for creating a brand and that brand cannot be Jayan Sharma. Because I started noticing since I want to build a team, since I want to make a company, since I want to scale a little, I cannot do it in my name. I'm not Amir Khan Productions. I need to build my personal brand. At the same time, I need to build a company's brand. And that is where I've done reasonably well. We still can do much, much better. If you start a company, from the day you start the company's name, you start pondering over. Ten years later, if this company becomes really big, will you call that SLV graphic designs? Or will you, will you call that, uh, what can I say? Will you call that um, some, some cool name which is scalable? It, SLV is good for a darshini because it will not scale to two, three more. It might scale like mayas and stuff like that. But you have to think like that, I felt. And so I started a company with a reasonably good brand name. Uh, what one of the things I must admit and is one of the biggest problems is uh, for an artist um, realizing the artistic ego and keeping it at bay. It's very, very normal and common for artists to, you know, uh, go on a trip, um, not to Africa, but on an ego trip. Uh, very often it happens because we create and people are like, wow, yenri, wow, dbhuta, and then we feel that, you know, things are great. So sometimes, um, I mean, standing here, I know what are the not so great things about all these points about my own business, which is what I want to share. At least I know there are problems that I need to solve. So where am I today here? Um, I am at a juncture where last 12 years, no business background, only creative background. 
I have at least learnt what I should be doing in the next five years and what I should be aiming for in the next 10 years and a lot of problems, lot of problems. In fact, out of these five, four have serious problems that I need to ponder over. And uh, it, it's okay for me to share this because you know, it's not just always people who have achieved something should share their learnings. People who have realized what they need to achieve also can share so that some people who are beginning uh, will not go through 12 years of learning, making mistakes like I did. Thankfully, I am still able to, uh, if I work hard and if luck is on my side, I can still pull it off. It's not too late. But you don't need 12 years to learn this if you have mentors, if you come to places like these and listen from great people. And uh, of course, um, uh, before thinking about just the core service of, let's say you want to start a restaurant, I know how to cook. There is a lot more to a restaurant than cooking, uh, branding, you, you know, in fact, marketing, in fact, so many things, right? All of you know the functions of a business from um, HR to R&D and all of that. So if you start thinking like that, not just about your core strength and passion, then I think you have a very fair chance of uh, becoming successful. If I look at my own business, if I had a partner who was financially much more sound, uh, he was not interested in a creative photograph. He would say, hey, too much anagi the photo, but dude, damn it, that is the feedback I wish people like me had when we began uh, our business. So lastly, I want to leave us all with this thought. Uh, it's a famous uh, thought. Uh, he says, creativity is seeing what others see and thinking what no one else has ever thought. This is not just true for creativity. It's also true for businesses and entrepreneurs and stuff like that. So that's my little story. I uh, do hope uh, there was something for all of us to think about. I know I didn't teach anything or I didn't preach anything, but at least uh, for creative people who want to start a business uh, using their passion, uh, there's a lot of things you need to be careful about so that you uh, probably achieve success much faster than I will ever have. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that was a very good question. Uh, one of the things that I always tell people is things are available, but you got to do something with it. So I'm okay with uh, open AI. In fact, it opens up the opportunity for a lot more people. So you don't have to do that part. See, one of the things I mentioned is uh, like about five, ten years ago, Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, they open sourced all the AI ML algorithms. And when we were doing, I was trying to do my PhD, I didn't complete. Just implementing one of those things could get you a PhD. Now everything is free. But what it allowed me to do was focus on my actual mission of uh, how do I, did, uh, how do I uh, predict injuries? How do I predict, uh, prevent injuries? So that means you can focus more not on the context, but on the core. So there is the concept of core versus context. So a lot of things, once they become open source, it becomes context, anybody can have it. But you still need to do something about it. So there, in Christianity, there is something called God has a plan for you. I have a second part. You need to execute it. Yeah. Uh, I have something to add to this. I have been seeing since the last 40 years um, that technology is something which is the only uh, change which will happen all the time. It's, it's uh, definitely happening all the time. So let me relate to my own field of photography. When I used to be a, a five, six year old child, I used to see my father take pictures in black and white film, right? When I became a teenager, it was color film. When I became a 22, 23 year old guy, it became a digital camera. Now I am in my 40s, I'm talking about cameras like artificial intelligence in the cameras. Like I, I can yeah. point my camera here, it's going to pick up your eyes and focus. Yeah. Now the question is, since cameras are evolving, what happens to people who are creative photographers? Are they going to lose their profession? I think it's, the, it's, it's true with even your uh, graphic design softwares. Like I remember in 1993, I used to sit on a PC-80 using a uh, dot matrix printer and use a software called finger paint, right? We used to draw Mahatma Gandhi with all the dot, it was a dot matrix uh, uh, thing. Now, today we are, we are almost able to create something realistic using AI, using many different technologies. I think technology will keep changing and it will keep making things easier for us. Now what happens to people like us? Are we going to lose our use or importance of creativity? No. The benchmark of what is good keeps increasing. So 20 years ago somebody made Gandhiji kind of something was great. Now today people, you know, the benchmark of what is good will keep on going up 
ಲೈಕ್ವೈಸ್ ಇನ್ ವೈಲ್ಡ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಫೋಟೋಗ್ರಫಿ ಐ ಟೆಲ್ ಯು ವೆನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಎ ಕಿಡ್ ವಿ ಯೂಸ್ ಟು ಗೋ ಟು ನಾಗರ್ ಹೊಳೆ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಕ್ರಾಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ರೋಡ್ ಫೋಟೋ ಅಂದರೆ ಅಯ್ಯೋ 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 ಯೂಸ್ ಟು ಸೇ ಟುಡೇ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕ್ಲಿಕ್ ದಟ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅವಾರ್ಡ್ ವಿನಿಂಗ್ ವೈಲ್ಡ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಫೋಟೋಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ರೀಚ್ ಎ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಬೆಂಚ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿ ವಿಲ್ ಪುಷ್ ದಟ್ ಬೆಂಚ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟಿವ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ವಿಲ್ ಕೀಪ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಯೂಸಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಅಡ್ವಾನ್ಸ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿ ಇನ್ ಕೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಫರ್ದರ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಯಾ with that we'll go with the first yeah. question you can also yeah. ask for photography tips yeah i think I yeah. question to sanjeev uh, especially on the predictive analytics uh, take going back to the kohli's example the virat kohli's now when he can use predictive analysis can he not correct himself where he has gone wrong and how it will unless he correct himself he will continue to go wrong the failures that he has had in the last few has he not used these predictive analytics to correct himself and uh, Oh, can I uh, correct myself? Oh, oh Him- correct. Uh, himself. Yeah. So what we try to do is, uh, there is a quote, uh, uh, I think it's attributed to Niels Bohr. I think he made it uh, more popular. Prediction is difficult, especially the future. So what we do is, uh, we can only say this, based on all the historical data that we have, of something similar, the uh, condition that you're going through, this is the probability of a happening probability of b happening probability of c happening see sometimes people were saying they should he should just resign he should just walk out he won't, he's not going to do that but if you give him some three options and give him the probability then he may say no no i understand i think i don't have to walk out i if i come later in the order i can do better so again any time uh, we are using predictive analytics uh we can actually provide them probability of scenarios and one other just example that i found uh which actually got me started so there was a guy called cam newton who was a, a fairly decent quarterback and he was a big man 6 6 foot 5 his big frame and he was a colored person and this the, those were the early days where colored people became quarterbacks and they thought only white people can become quarterbacks because they don't have the other colored people don't have the acumen that was not true but he made a complaint about one thing he said when white people get hit the white quarterbacks get hit he, they get called for foul the guy but people are routinely hitting me they're hitting me like five times more than him because i'm bigger than him stronger than him and nobody gives a damn so we said okay we double clicked on the data and we showed that he was in fact not the most hit in fact uh tom brady a lot of white folks got hit and they had started developing how to avoid the hits because when the hits are coming you have three less than a second to react and there are like 300 pound people who can run like crazy and they are coming to you with the sole intentions of hurting you so you better learn how to avoid those things so uh, drew brees and a few other guys were white guys smaller guys they learned how to avoid they learned from karate they learned from judo and other stuff and something is hitting you how do you move so that those things we can actually show them instead of saying you made this claim let's look at the data that's where the video analytics comes so we are able to show the anatomy of a hit so what happened so then you are actually showing him and not preaching that person you're saying okay let's look at this you made the statement let's so we can use especially in the injury analytics how do you avoid the injuries so let me recap your question so what has been the success rate of predictive analytics one of the advantages or disadvantages of predictive analytics uh, you can not hear can you hear okay so advantages or disadvantages of predictive analytics that the results are known because we put our predictions on facebook so we have predicted let's say 10, 100 games and everybody knows that we predicted 75 games or 60 games so we cannot hide so that is one good thing so we were lucky in the first year so the statistically well behaved year coincided with our first year so we cannot replicate that so then coming to uh, the other uh, games uh, for example baseball is easier to predict basketball is easier to predict so they have baselines because cricket used to be easier to predict one of the things that they had to do is to copy what uh, nfl had done nfl was manufactured for betting and tv that means they had to make it unpredictable does not mean on a 100 game series it's unpredictable but any given game 
anybody can win. So if you look at IPL, why that is so? Because they made it short. They made it um, offense driven, not defense. So they made uh, scoring easier. And then as he said, as technology improves, people become better. Here as the demands of this unpredictability uh, increases, people are hitting shots that uh, nobody ever hit. So they would hit something like this, they would hit cross bat, which was considered uh, blasphemous. So now the prediction also we need to keep track of that. So IPL has become harder to predict. Uh, but over a, people ask me, can you, did you predict this upset? No, no, we cannot predict a specific upset, but we can tell before the game, what are the chances of this being an upset? Or we can say, is this going to be a high scoring game or a low scoring game? So that kind of things we can predict, but over a period of time, not my models, any person, uh, not our models, any person's good model generally beats experts. But it does not beat the crowd as a whole. If you look at the crowd, if you ask 100, uh, 10, uh, maybe 20,000 people, they predict, they beat the data and they beat the, uh, the experts, because experts have a bias. But the data, when you see thousands of people predict, some will uh, correct and overall they will be good. So, but so we do crowdsourcing of information. So our apps, our goal is as many people download as possible. They are feeding us back and then we will correct our predictions. You had a question about Formula One. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, see Formula One, uh, most people do not realize it's a team sport. Even though there is one person who is actually driving, there is a team behind it. There is a technique behind it. And I got introduced to Formula One through one of my, my, my brother. So he showed me, it is, even though it is one person at the deal, there is a lot of team. The, even the machine that they have has a lot of sensors, a lot of analytics. And they are also generating a lot of data. When we have a lot of data that we can tap into, our predictions become better. So even individual sports are uh, become amenable to prediction as long as they generate a lot of data. So as uh, Mahesh, so what is your, your name? Uh, Ajay was mentioning, a um, lot of people are now embedding sensors. So sensors are all over the body. So we are able to collect data about tennis and or any other field, any other individual sports, but definitely the team sports are more fun to be uh, predicting because there's a lot of moving parts, especially uh, NFL, because everybody moves. Uh, one example probably you can relate to is when you compress a video, NFL uh, uh, videos don't compress much because everybody is moving. But when you compress uh, a cricket, only a few people are moving. So a lot of things are constant. So the more moving parts, it's more fun for us to predict. But it can be used for others. One of the uh, things that we want to say is we are building a framework for predicting sports and I always say I look at sports as a microcosm of a competitive business. So the only difference is this things happen in front of millions of people. The performance is clear. The winners and losers are clear. What went into is clear. A lot of things become open. So we can as businesses can learn a lot and I call business sports in slow motion. I have a few already pushed in, but uh, it's still a skeptical market. As I said, artists don't understand money better. So imagine crypto. Uh, so it's even worse. So uh, we are still learning about it. We still don't know. Most of the questions I get uh, to see what people are asking is how do we convert that to rupees kind of questions. So it is still early stages, but a lot of people are at least creating and pushing it uh, as NFT uh, art, uh, you know, uh, things. I think in a year's time, we should be uh, seeing a lot of transactions happen. Uh, at in, the, in the present uh, stage, I think it's just a learning phase for most artists. I mean, honestly, in my case, there's a lot more to do. Uh, but thank you for that question. Uh, I think um, a lot of people don't think about um, why they are doing something. Um, and they do it for their pleasure, which is fair enough. But if they want it to be you know, let's say monetized or, you know, if they wanted to, like for example, let's say award winning, let's, let's say not even a business, somebody wants to do photography and win an award, could be a hobby, right? 
So um, I think people need to uh, start thinking about what kind of pictures win awards, they should observe contests, they should, I think rational thinking is a little bit difficult in artistic minds. So when you start doing that, then you'll realize you're not taking pictures for yourself. I, I, by the way, this is a question for many people who do photography. I keep asking, uh, who do you click pictures for, yourself or for an audience? Most people say, I do it for myself. I answer this question all the time and every time I ask myself, has it changed? I'm very sure I don't click pictures for myself at all. I click pictures for an audience. And who that audience is, it could be a magazine, it could be a, a, a judge who is evaluating it for a contest, it could be... So depending on the audience, I need to create something which is relevant. Here people create something that they like and they try and push it to different kinds of class of people and they find it's not working sometimes. So I think when I realized that, then I only create it for that purpose. If I'm creating something for an award winning purpose, then I have to look at that as an output and create it. So rational thinking is what I would request people who are creative to start um, you know, applying. Once that applies, then we'll also be able to judge our work a little better. And usually don't take feedback from your wife, your spouse, your child, your friends, because they'll say, wow, super, Nash New York try model night. That is not the kind of feedback you need. Find a mentor and show pictures and find a purpose of why that pictures were shot. Then it makes sense because each purpose is different. For winning a contest is different. For making fine art prints on the wall is different. Like I'll give you an example. My first picture which got published was two monitor lizards standing on hind legs and fighting. It was a very, you know, a rare moment in natural history. I was super proud. But I can hand on heart tell you nobody in this world, my greatest admirers will never buy that to put it on their wall. It's a monitor lizard after all. It's not a hummingbird. So if I want to sell a fine art print, I cannot be shooting a monitor lizard. So that is what I mean when I say rational thinking. Depending on why you are taking a picture, what's the purpose of it, your process changes. Yeah, I think, uh, see there are a lot of ways to look at uh, being an entrepreneur. Again, I have learned a lot more from my failures. Uh, so I have a simple thing that somebody asked me, can you, in the interviews they've asked me, oh, can you talk to me about your strengths and weaknesses? I said, how much time you got? Well, strength will be just a couple of minutes, but the other one may take a couple of days. You have a list of weaknesses. So what I believe is, I don't think you should focus on your weakness. You should focus on your strength. How do I improve my strength? Because the strength that matters for that particular specific aspect, you have a strength, but I have a lot of weakness. I can't sing, even my life depends on it. I would like to sing, uh, but I can't sing. I would like to play like uh, Virat Kohli, not current form, but, uh, but I can't play for even my life depends on it. But I do some things really well, but as uh, you said, Jan said, but will somebody pay for this? If I'm just going to do it for my hobby, I can continue. But if I want to sustain it as a business and I want to hand it off, I want to build a team, then you have to not just do your own work, as you, as you said, uh, but build on that. So, but the key is you have to have some passion and you shouldn't do it for the money. I always, initially you should not be doing it for the money. Money will come as a byproduct. So one thing I always tell people is, are you creating value? So for us, we wanted to create a betting platform or a, a fantasy platform. So today, maybe 100 people bet, but the market is, let's say, a million people. Can I make this now usable by 100,000 people? Initially, they may not uh, pay you, but eventually they pay. Like, look at WhatsApp or something. I mean, the whole country runs on WhatsApp today, and it's a practically free product. And they paid $19 billion. So don't focus money immediately coming from somebody, but if you're creating value, sustainable value, that, and you continue to improve that value, then I think you will eventually get monetized, but may not be immediate monetization, at least in our consumer field. Uh, one more thing I want to com comment is, so just like you, you use some other word, like we use this design thinking to a fault yeah. because that's where you understand the customer. Will some customer value this? Payment comes later. If, if he doesn't even value that, how will he pay? So that is, I think, the key is to think of value that you can build and have a plan and execute it. So that is more important to us. That's what I think. Anyway, thank you. Yeah.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Manyata Mahesh, student member of Thai Mysore, and today uh, it's probably the easiest but yet most gratifying job. The word of thanks. It's been a fabulous two hours of very informative session today, thanks to insightful perspectives shared by our speakers, Mr. Sanjeev Chandrasekhar and Mr. Jayan Sharma. It has been a very educative experience for all of us especially the student members to sit through these sessions i'm sure this will be a very grateful in a long way in preparing us for the career ahead the success of today's event is largely because of the speakers who have taken out the time from their busy schedule to share their perspectives with us so i would like to acknowledge my gratitude to mr Ch sanjeev chandrasekhar ceo of sharpa analytics for his address towards his inspiring story of how he started Sherpa. Thank you, sir, for the insightful session. And my special thanks to Mr. Jayant Sharma, CEO of Toehold Travel and Photography Private Limited, for his address on entrepreneurship and creativity. Thank you, sir, for the excellent perspective. I must mention my deep sense of appreciation for our beloved president of Thai Mysuru chapter, Mr. Sudanwa Dananjaya, for the opening remarks and welcoming the gathering. Thank you, sir. <laughs> A special thanks to Ms. Dr. Mahesh Rao, board member of Thai Mysuru chapter, for introducing us to our new Thai members. Thank you, sir. Further, I would like to thank all the charter members, associate members, student members for making up this endless contribution to the event. Thank you everyone for being here with us this evening and contributing for this successful event. It has been a great pleasure. On behalf of Thai team, thank you. Thank you, Manita, for that. Uh, Again, uh, Sanjeev and Jayan, thank you for joining us and uh, we, you know, want to uh, grace your presence for dinner and networking as well. Yeah. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll close the session and we are open for dinner and networking. Have a nice time. Uh, thank you for joining us today.